A closed heart and a closed mind go hand in hand, mm. and they lead swiftly and certainly to death, you know, and when people just won't let go of their own certainty, which is what's tearing the world apart nowadays, mm. uh, because they're too terrified mm. of the alternative, you have dead people. You have dead worlds, you have dead civilization, nothing alive is flowing in it. Cynthia Bourgeau, thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful place in France, uh, Bonnevaux. Um, I'm just wondering, just as a start, if you could talk about like where we are. This is such a sacred place. Yeah. Well, we are in, well, a little outside of Poitiers, right in the absolute smack dab center of France, I think. Uh, if you put it on a target with bullseye, that's where it would be. And we are at a center that was bought fairly recently, within the past decade, uh, by the World Community of Christian Meditation, led by Father Lawrence Freeman. Uh, he had a great vision of developing it as a center for the particular uh, meditation practice that has uh, he's been associated with for years and years and years. And uh, it's very interesting because while the property was a private residence when they bought it, it had a long history as a Benedictine Cistercian monastery built like back in the 12th or 13th century. So it has this ancient spiritual ambience in it. And what Lawrence saw that was so brilliant was this would serve as a natural sort of fusion between the what you might call the cutting edge of a new Christian vision based in meditation mm -hmm. and this beautiful rich tradition that comes to us from a 1500 year legacy. Brilliant. So he's uh, he'd very quickly developed a community that would be the core residential community here. And they're developing it as a retreat center doing all sorts of marvelous things. Interesting. Um, I wanted to start too about sort of defining a little bit about who you are for the audience to kind of understand when we get into some of these issues, yeah. where you're coming from. And it's interesting, this word mystic comes up around your name. Yeah. You know, that word is, is, is put on you. And a lot of people hear that word and it's either confusing to them, it turns them off, or they get excited about it, like myself. Yeah. So what is a mystic and are you a mystic? <laughs> well, uh, as you say, it's put on me. People can, and so it's always a projection of whatever they think a mystic is. And I'm, I'm, I'm willing to dance to almost any projections or none. Uh, but for me, uh, mystic, you know, the classic definition is, uh, what did the mystic say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. And it, so the, this, the image is a person who walks around with this particular sort of warm, fuzzy closeness to God. And uh, that kind of a definition I'm not crazy about. But the kind of definition that does appeal to me is that, uh, is that people that get wind up being labeled mystics mm. think in a different way. Mm. And it's, a, it's, it's not the rational, conceptual mind laying out philosophical premises. Mm. It's, it's more like a kind of sacred, silent poetry where things are, uh, you're perceiving in many different senses and knitting the picture together with what the classic tradition calls the eye of the heart. And when you understand that the eye of the heart doesn't mean some sort of fuzzy emotion, but a whole different way of perception that doesn't hack up the, perce the perceptual field into different bits and pieces, mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, I would say I gravitate to the people that think that way and live that way, and they all get to to uh, to be they get to be called mystics. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, I think that way too. And so if you want to call me mystic, go for it. So no, you don't name yourself a mystic. People have to see you, assess your work, kind of assess your heart in a sense, and say that's a mystic. And yeah. it's a special title because you can't say, "Well, I'm a mystic." Yeah, you don't go to a mystic certification school, <laughs> you know. And, uh, you know, and and mystic is kind of a moniker that they put on you, mm. and uh, 
And it is, it is in some ways divisive. As you say, people either love it or hate it. Uh, if they love it, it's because they're drawn to a deeper depth of direct experience of the divine realm. If they hate it, it's because they think it's an excuse for fuzzy thinking. Mm, okay. On top of this, this mystic label that's put on you for, for the work and the body of work you've contributed and, and your deep thinking, you know, you also come from the Christian tradition. Yeah. Are you a Christian? I would say yes. Okay. But not, uh, not in the way that it's used, at least in my country, uh, by the people that claim it as a kind of exclusive category, not a, not a biblical literalist, literalist fear and damnation, you know, uh, Jesus died for your sins sort of Christian, but uh, a, a Christian in the spirit of, of sensing that Jesus really brought uh, a transformational message of, of, uh, of a consciousness completely grounded in love of an evolutionary consciousness that's, uh, that's desperately needed in our time, along with a compassionate morality. Mm. So as a Christian, a lover, and in some ways a follower of Jesus and Jesus Christ, but it's not the exclusive path that, that you choose to tap into. Oh God, no. Uh, I mean, it was what, what you discover when you start working on the paths is that as they get deeper to their mystical wellsprings, they're, they're in a deep sense interchangeable. And I don't mean by that that they all have the same theologies. They don't. Each one is like a precious color of the rainbow. Uh, but every master, every path is in every other path when you converge towards their origin. Mm. And so, uh, you know, when you're a when you're a Christian and you go into Sufi worship, you you can go fully into Sufi worship, and it's the Christian in you that's worshiping, mm. and that doesn't require a translation mechanism to say, "Oh, this is really Jesus." It really isn't. It's Sufism, mm. but uh, but because they're all joined at the hip at the origin, uh, they they uh, they can shape shift. Brilliant. And right before we go deeper, this is just a simple question. It's on defining God. Yeah. Um, as we move forward, and we might use that word God a little bit. Yeah. Um, when people ask you, how do you define God today? What, what do you tell them? Well, I say, uh, let's not define God. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but since you're going to insist, because that's what your mind is going to do. And for most people, it's a real starting point. Uh, God is the name that gets conveniently put on divine reality when it chooses to present itself in a personal form. And we choose to receive it and interact with it in a personal form. Uh, and that is to say that divine reality is bigger than God and transpersonal. But that doesn't mean that God is, that, that therefore personal is fake or little. Mm. Because the divine, by some miracle that God only knows why, uh, elected way back before there was anything at all to, to place, uh, place the infinite in finite containers mm. in order to bring forth, I believe, some dimension of divine reality that can only be experienced in the dance with finitude. And so if you back that down a thousand miles, uh, you sitting here in a form that's Ryan and me sitting here in a form that's Cynthia, each with this kind of convinced sense that we have our own soul and our own nature, as long as we're operating out of that place in ourself, uh, the, the, the divinity on the other side of that is God. And the relationship is going to be personal, uh, a pouring from infinite and finite. Mm. And, and that has worth. A lot of people out there in the ev evolutionary movement say, no, no, that's just an inferior sort of immature stage of consciousness. Get on with it. But we have to remember, and, and one of the things that I love about Christianity and its centrality of mm. Jesus is it brings it right back and says, no, God chose to take form. Because something so precious is spoken and made manifest of the nature of divine reality through this interaction that's personal, mm. that we can't get, get rid of it. Mm. So, so for me, 
the God is really the personal point of entry and connection into this whole divine realm. But if you just call it the divine realm, it gets so kind of airy fairy and vague that you lose the heart. Right. You know, that, that Teilhard de Chardin just said, you can't fall in love with an ideal. You don't fall in love with divine reality. Mm. I, I mean, you mm. fall in love with a beloved. Mm. And a beloved is the personal. And, and so the divine is willing to become God so that this celebration of the personal can, can release the quality that I think is at the heart of everything, which is mm. love. Hmm. So God, in a way, to try to define it, is sort of a human sort of endeavor. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that allows us to be in our persons without getting stuck in them. I mean, because, you know, just as God could be in Jesus without getting stuck in Jesus, so you could be Ryan without being just Ryan, you know, and, and that's the kind of compulsion and obsession and fear of our day. I'm just this little self. I'm me. I'm, I'm, I'm my ego self. Uh, and when I die, it's all over. And so there's this panic to actualize and, and tell our story and make our story complete. And it's all unnecessary. That's where the mystic comes in. Because these are just, uh, you know, you can't say the roles we play because they're real live roles. You know, Hamlet is a role, but Hamlet is as real as anything in the planet. I mean, it's, uh, it's where the juice is flowing, mm. but it's the necessary convention we both put up with, both the divine and the finite, so that something can be generated through this dance. Right. Okay, so good setting the scene of the kind of thinking that we have. Yeah. And centering prayer, contemplative prayer, I think in my life radically changed me. Mm -hmm. It's only when, and I think we have some, some connection here, yeah. because to discover that radicalizes you and it changes everything, yeah. or it did for me. Yeah. I, I, I heard you say that you felt you almost discovered it late in your sort of spiritual journey in a sense in 1988, and you had been, I believe, a priest for 10 years yeah. when you discover it. What, how did you find it and how did it radicalize you? Yeah. Well, I discovered centering prayer late in life fairly, but uh, I wasn't unfamiliar with mm. silence because I'd had the great privilege of growing up as a, as in Quaker schools. And they had silent meeting for worship as part of uh, every week. So all of us little kids, and I mean really young kids, 12 to 5 years old, would troop into the old meeting house and just sit in silence until the Holy Spirit moved someone to get up and give a little bit of a talk or a prayer. Or a, uh, and But it was in that silence that probably what people call the mystic in me was born. Mm. The sense of the possibility of a direct communion with the intimate. Uh, and so, so when I, uh, I went away f from it for a while, and yes, did get into parish priesting in the Episcopal Church and, uh, and theological education, writing, all that sort of stuff. But when the path wandered back and I discovered Centering Prayer and sat down for my first meditation, it was like an instant, you know, not, not flashback, but transport back. Mm -hmm to where I was when I was a young child, and something recognized that. So it was, it was more like coming home. Hmm. Is there a, was there a particular moment, a particular day, a sitting, where it clicked, that, that kind of sticks out with you and, and is forever in your mind? Um, no. Uh, it, it was kind of cumulative, in a way. Uh, the, the thing that sticks out in my mind was the day that I bumped into into uh, Jesus actually when I took communion when I wound up in a communion line accidentally and received my first communion and said, "Oh my God, this is the real deal," you know, uh, and that was a moment that changed everything. That was a moment where I got dragged kicking and screaming into Christianity uh, or back into Christianity, but but. You know, contemplative prayer, if it's really good, is, I think, dramaless. Okay. You know? How so? Well, because it, it quietly uh, wears away or bores away at that, not only your, your sense of your finite self, that I am my little me, uh, 
but it it bores away at that whole sort of mechanism of 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 uh, you know perceptual mechanism that that always pictures I on the inside and everything else out there, including God on the outside, and that's a trick of the hardwiring. I mean, that's how our mind works at a certain level, and what. What Centering Prayer does, and what I was already experiencing in the Quakerism of my childhood, was that when something begins to deprogram that, then immediately being trapped in a finite self disappears. And it doesn't disappear into this sort of like out-of-body experience. It disappears into, oh, well, that's just irrelevant. Why did you ever think there was any separation in the first place? Uh, so, little by little, Thomas Keating, my teacher, called it taking a brief vacation from yourself. But it was, uh, I think what Centering Prayer did was to uh, begin to slowly, you know, erase that, that hard-edged wiring that creates this great drama of self and this mm. great compulsion to tell it as narrative. Yeah. So you just sit there and you know nothing changes and uh, one of my teachers says you have to endure the tedium until something emerges in it. Mm. But I, I, I really think that's the beginning of the, the new way of seeing. Absolutely. And you talk about, as Keating said, the vacation from yourself. And my own experience when I'm having a vacation for myself, it's rare, it's beautiful, it's special. Mm -hmm but I'm in a different sort of sensory perception. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk about, if you don't mind, when you kind of hit that point, when you're on a, like a real serious, awesome vacation from mm -hmm. yourself, what does it feel like? Yeah. Well, there are two modes. Uh, there's the mode uh, where you're in meditation and it, it feels like nothing. Thomas mm -hmm. Kidding said the greatest experience of God is no experience. Right. And, and the reason that there is no experience is because that subject-object dualism that turns you into the experiencer of experience disappears. So it's just quiet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's gathered quiet. Sometimes it's, uh, it's something even more modest than gathered quiet. You just, you know, that self-reflection drops out altogether. Mm. But this doesn't necessarily equate with deep, profound states of bliss. You know, that's, I think that's one of the, the, the kind of cliches that's got put on it mm. in recent years, particularly when Eastern meditation practices wet mess net Western categories of consciousness. Mm. So we have this kind of stereotype in our mind that you get gathered in centering prayer and it gets really, really deep and the silence gets deep and you experience this deep silence and there's deep bliss. Mm. You know, I mean, that's a construct. Okay. You know, what happens is just the, the experiencer drops away and you're just there. And, and there's a deeper awareness that knows you're there, but it doesn't feel compelled to, to justify itself by saying, oh, what a deep state. Right. And, and then the funny thing that happens, and this is the other side I was talking about, is that these things will come back when you're in the middle of, of daily life. Mm. You know, when you're in the train station, you know, trying to sit in the middle of the crowd, you know, that's the line stretching out the door trying to get your train ticket to come down here to Poitiers, and you're stressed and you're hassled, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this sort of, mm. it all drops away. All the hassle, all the aggravation, all the story, all the considering. And, and what's there is just a kind of bare presence and almost a sort of delight. Okay, well, this is the challenge now. Let's, uh, uh, so I, I call that the kind of incarnational version of it because it's the, it's the ocean coming into the drop to just kind of. Mm. And, and those are the states that I recognize as the real kind of uh, you know, non-romanticized right. versions of contemplative experience. When you have those moments, though, when you're kind of like clued in that you're kind of 
present and ex experiencing something physiologically is anything happening is it a wave of euphoria even if it's minor or is it literally in the same state you are presumably right now yeah Do, is it is there something that triggers to let you know oh that's it yeah i would say that the oh that's it comes with an instant infusion of joy mm. but i use the word carefully because I don't mean by that euphoria, intoxication. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work through flooding you with positivity so that all negativity drops out. It's just a kind of quiet reminder mm -hmm. that all the ways that you've been tormenting yourself don't really exist anyway. Mm -hmm. And there's this, I would say, if there's any dimension to it, it's, uh, it's spaciousness. Mm -hmm. and, and spaciousness is so delightful mm -hmm that the, the response you feel is joy. You said it was okay to bring up off-camera topics that were sort yeah. of con controversial that the young sure. people were talking yeah. about, but drugs is a big thing right now, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ay ayahuasca and, yeah. and mushrooms and LSD and marijuana. To have people are having experiences like this, but yeah. they're almost on that next level of euphoria. They're you know, often described as spiritual experience. Yeah. Where are you at in terms of a? If you if you want to talk about it, your own use of any psychoactive drugs in meditation, or people who come and say, "Oh, this is the key. It's these drugs." Yeah. Well, I've been a non-user all my life. Okay. You know, even pot disgusted me very. Okay. Very. Uh, and uh, I I try to be non-judgmental because things that you're a non-user of uh, uh, is you don't really have a right to say anything because you're going to likely wind up in negative judgment that will hurt someone. But I, I really feel that this extensive you know, drug use is once again one of the fallouts of our false conception of, of equating a contemplative experience or a mystical experience with an experience. Uh, and that means that your experience experience or dilute uh, you know, dualism is still really strong in you. Mm. And so, in an extent, it's a good gateway because so many people are trapped in, you know, imprisoned in these small cell stories of themselves that have been given to them by, their, by this over-anxious helicopter parenting, succeed, improve, you know, do, 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 get your resume together. And a sense of, you know, what for? Mm. Uh, so initial experiences that there is such a thing as spaciousness may get you through the gate, but until you can move from that mm. into really moving on to the question of how does the infinite and the finite dance, a lot of people just become addicted mm. to uh, spacious states. Mm. And that's another addiction, particularly when it's founded on a cliche. So basically, what I've found mm. is that like a good swig of aspirin, uh, mm. the, the way I find that the the practices are, are good is for uh, medic medicinal use. I mean, I've, I've seen dramatic effect treating depression, treating anxiety, mm. uh, and, and when these are needed, I mean, I know a couple of people who are on the planet because of mm. that. But I, I would tend to approach them from that point of view, right. that they're, they're there to get you at least to a level pl playing field. Right. And from there, the traditions that I've worked with, and that as a Westerner and a Western woman, I've been entitled to work with, mm. uh, strongly form you that this stuff is going to get in the way, mm. that it's going to cement the wrong kind of approaches and relationships in you, mm. and that what you really need to do is be able to work out of your own small conscious selfhood mm. uh, and pay it back in, uh, in uh, what my friend Rami Shapiro, my wonderful Jewish buddy and mystic, calls not altered states of, of consciousness, but altered states of behavior. Mm. So just just to recap, you've never used drugs as a part of your spiritual practice. Uh -huh. But I think I can relate to something you're saying, that for some people it might show them what the feeling is to a degree. Yeah. But if you can't find that in your sober state, walking around the busy streets of London or 
feeling yeah. that what use is it if it if it just requires a substance to take you there exactly. and it becomes a crutch and when I spoke to James Finley, he said that thing to me because I was trying to tell him, James, like, tell me about a time you've had this crazy experience of euphoria. And I wanted to know about the craziness. And he said, yeah. I'll tell you about that. Yeah. But first, let me tell you about the small ways we experience it. And that kind of transformed me a little bit. To, now I see it yeah. and feel it without needing it to feel big yeah. and expansive. And it changes your life so you can move through the world. Yeah. With yeah. that as your base level, in a way, are able to kind of bring it back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We want to we want to have our cake and eat it too, mm. and we want to do that for really, really, really long time in the spiritual journey. Almost the gateway into what I call the real non-dual level mm. is when you give up on that fantasy. Mm. So you want to have these great experiences of God. You want to take selfies with yourself and God, and and as long as you're working on that, which unfortunately this 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 strange sort of hybrid of Eastern and Western mysticism has compounded that tendency in people. Uh, as long as you're working out of that paradigm, uh, you're going to become a, uh, a, you know, the best you can do is become a mystical junkie. Mm. And that's, uh, that's not where the ultimate transformation lies. Right. So as long as, as sooner people can stand yeah. on their own two feet and start walking toward it in their integrated being, mm. the better it is. But I do have one friend who's a classic example, and I'll try and say this strong enough that uh, that that you know, or vaguely enough so that I don't reveal identities. But uh, they sought out, you know, uh, the plant medicine mm. uh, with one of the the. You know, their husband and wife pair, and and one of them was was uh, was really plagued with just debilitating, debilitating, you know, borderline psychotic depression, mm. and uh, under extreme wise guidance by uh, indigenous teachers who actually knew the tradition, uh, they were able to help this person uh, integrate. Mm. Uh, the partner tried to do it also to, to demonstrate largely broad-mindedness, but had no such issues uh, in this person's self, and they uh, they got out and left field a little bit. Mm. I mean, so what, what was really, really good for one person, uh, integrating them as a non-fractured ego, was for the other person sort of fraying the seams and making them dissociative. So I think it, it it requires very shrewd case by case mm -hmm. discrimination, but mm -hmm. but starting with it as a therapy to fix something that's badly broken, I think is a healthier starting place than as a shortcut to nirvana. Interesting. Yeah. Um, this kind of relates a little bit. I was listening to this interview you gave, or maybe it was in one of your audiobooks. I've been listening over in the preparation for this, and I loved it so much. And you talked about the inner sanctuary. Yeah. And you talked about this idea when we're talking about contemplative prayer. Mm -hmm. For me, before I heard you say this, I was like, okay, hey, I'm going to this place. And you said, you can flip that on its head a little bit. You don't go there. Yeah. You come from there. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about how that is sort of a new, like an exciting way to reimagine what is what's happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I owe I owe a lot to it. It's a sort of popularization of an idea that was, I think, first helpfully introduced by the American philosopher of, of non-dual religion, Ken Wilber, mm. he says there's a difference between states and stages. States are, are things you go to, you know, places you go to. And that would be the equivalent of what we were just talking about, you know, using, you can, using drugs to bring in a state of mm. mystical euphoria. Stages are places you come from. In other words, you've reliably integrated it in your person, which means your finite self and your mm -hmm. infinite self are talking with each other and are on the same page, and they can somehow come together to be one person. Mm -hmm. uh, and when that happens, you begin to live out of it. So that rather than it being a little inner sanctuary, you go to tank up on peace or bliss or wholeness so that you can go out and live your, your, your life in the stressful circumstances of today, that, that it becomes formed in you so that you go out into life mm. as presence, and often peaceful presence, often blissful, but as a steadying uh, 
uh, emanating energy field in your own right mm. that actually changes the situation a little bit just by the force of your presence. So that's what I mean by you're coming from it. And I combined that, and I think it was in the same talk, you said Thomas Keating called it your own Big Bang yeah, inside yeah. of you. And obviously the idea of the Big Bang is where everything comes from. Yeah. And so it, it, in a visual sense, thinking about it, it was such a beautiful thought to be like, there's this small little seed of the Big Bang inside of me, yeah. and I'm emanating from that as is all reality. And that was just such a beautiful way to think about it. I love that. Yeah, that's great. And and the ancient Quakers talked about that, that that other self, that unboundaried self that you are becoming in the womb of this life uh, is like a seed growing within you. Mm. And, and entering and nurturing that, and I think that contemplative prayer is one of the finest ways to nurture it, certainly. Mm. But it will take over, and at some point, just like a, a child inheriting uh, the legacy of the, of the parent, the what has been your child, my little place I go to, my little, you know, becomes the parent mm. and takes the small self in hand and helps it serve as it has to serve in this life. Mm. That's so beautiful. Yeah. It's interesting, the amount of time you've spent, you've dedicated your whole life, or at least the last several decades, to this contemplative prayer. We're here at a place where you're about to give a retreat. Can you talk, like, when I think of the, the mystics and, and the hermit, I know I don't think you identify as a hermit at all, but I'm sure you've gone into serious solitude for extended period of times. What is, like, a day-to-day -day sort of experience like for you when you go up to your hermitage, or how would you describe the way you like to move in the world on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, it's marvelous, and uh, I... I interned in my hermiting under a, a, a really accomplished hermit out at the St. Benedict's Monastery at Snowbass. And, and he taught me to expect a lot of things that, were, uh, that actually happened. He said, and I discovered, that, that most days are ordinary. Mm -hmm. And you spend a lot of time orienting yourself and grounding yourself around simple chores. You know, life goes on, you know, you, you know, out in my hermitage, uh, I literally do uh, chop wood and lug water, except for a couple of months of the year when it's freezing, frozen, and, then, and at that point I chop water and lug wood, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but it's, uh, it, you live your day kind of in a three-centered awareness, uh, and that the, the natural rhythms, uh, he used to read cowboy novels up at the at the at his hermitage for part of the day just to kind of uh, defuse the the intense fireworks when there were these periods of great deep you know absorption in the divine. So it's sort of like that uh, that you you stumble around in every day like you do in the rest of the world, uh, but you realize that. You can't blame anybody else, mm -hmm. uh, and you you try and keep it as ordered as you need to. That that your part of the bargain is to try not to go crazy, you know, mm -hmm. to try to keep yourself as sane and coherent as you can, and that the the rest is up to God, who will push the limits as far as you mm -hmm. are able to uh, respond with integrated being, mm -hmm. but. But if you're wise, when you reach saturation point, you just lighten up. Mm -hmm. And the I and uh, I try as as Rave taught me to to watch carefully that you don't develop kind of uh, little idolatries on the side either fixations on your religious practice or what your altar looks like or, mm -hmm. you know, or, and, and he would never let me have pets. Okay. Because he says you just transfer your undealt with uh, affectional needs to your pet, mm -hmm. uh, that you have to learn how to stand in your own solitude. Mm -hmm. So that's what, uh, that's what it's like for me, right. basically. And the perp, when you're there and you're chopping wood and you're going, the idea is, you're also dedicating your life to trying to hear God and teach others or explain 
what you find in those silences, right? Because you're not just doing that and then not writing a book, not talking to me, mm -hmm. not coming to this retreat to talk to these people and hopefully inspire them and challenge them or whatever. Mm -hmm. what, what, are you, what are you hoping to accomplish? Is it a dedicated pursuit to be like, I'm dedicating my whole life to this. Mm -hmm. And out of those places, I trust God will meet me there and I will teach from it. Well, I actually think that's a little backwards. Tell me. I haven't dedicated my whole life to anything. You know, I've, I'm just... Uh, I'm just the other end of the whiplash, you know, that... that uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean that God is perfectly capable of initiating all stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's just that uh, the reality of this was clear and, uh, you know, invincibly impressed at me when I, when I took that first communion by accident, mm -hmm. that, okay, this is going to be the way it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that... Uh, that really I would say that I, you know, and it puts it slightly, slightly too pious terms, but I'm basically the, the handmaiden to the divine unfolding. Mm. So I don't waste a lot of time figuring out whether I'm dedicated to this, that, or the other, or what I have to do. It's like, you know, the sooner I can get retired, the better I'll like it. But, but uh, as long as it keeps rolling, I'm at its disposal. You surrendered to yeah. this calling, yeah. perhaps, that you felt on your life. Yeah, and I wouldn't even call it a calling. I mean, again, that puts too much emphasis <laughs> on me. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, you can say it's a being called. Uh, I mean, uh, my life is the calling. Uh, it's mm. like, you know, I, I follow the path of what the noise is. You know? Mm. You know? Let's talk about Jesus. I okay. grew up in the Christian church you're obviously greatly inspired by him. When we talk about this stuff about contemplative prayer and mysticism, talk about Jesus as mystic and Jesus as a person who practiced contemplative prayer. What do we know about him in those realms? Well, you know, you know you've got some scant passages in the Bible, but you, you know that from the level of consciousness that he was at and that he continues to influence the world at, that this is indeed a mystic and indeed a person of, of deep contemplation, or it wouldn't have, uh, it, it would never have rolled the way it did. Mm. You know, it's, it's really interesting for me that, uh, that, that when Jesus was picking up his disciples and, you know, forming his merry band along the shores of Galilee, they joined just because their jaws dropped. They'd never met a person like that. Uh, he was coming from himself in the way we talk, talked about it. So, uh, so obviously you have a profound uh, gathered spiritual presence within a human being. And that, for me, is virtually the, the definition of a contemplative life. He was clearly coming from and, and modeling, probably 2,000 years ahead of his time in the West, uh, the next evolutionary stage of consciousness, which we've mm. come to calling non-dual today, mm. uh, and teaching people how to live their lives out of that consciousness. So, uh, you know, for me... All the theology that's grown up around Jesus mm -hmm. uh, really gets in the way of people simply understanding and relating to the simple truth of the power that he not only was but is. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the Christian theologians very early on got sidetracked in trying to uh, demonstrate how he was different from everybody else. Mm -hmm. Uh, how he alone was the unique son of God. Well, that's crazy. He was an avatar. I mean, and he may have been the unique son of God, but we're all unique sons of God or daughters of God. Uh, that, but the problem was the operating system that can only define identity by being different from everybody else, mm -hmm. you know. And so how is Jesus different from everybody else? And Christianity then got tortured inside by all these complex doctrines of how the divine and the human fit in his nature, and then the big doctrines of how he was different in quality from any other enlightened religious being in the mm -hmm. world. And it just puts Jesus up on this weird pedestal mm -hmm that makes it really, really impossible for people who would otherwise just pick it up in a heartbeat mm. to, to 
to latch on to him as a mysteriously still present first order spiritual uh, companion and guide. Mm. And of course, the Bible is this book that has become the, yeah. the holy book of the Christians and tells Jesus' story. And you said this thing that just really resonated me too about the re literal reading the Bible yeah. is sort of unproductive and almost dangerous. Yeah. And I think it goes exactly what you're saying to put a, a dualistic approach on some of these verses and not understand the patriarchal sort of societies in which potentially, you know, that they were written in. But yeah. talk about that. Why is it dangerous to read the Bible as literal? Well, because uh, at the literal level, it it's all based on, you know, my God is better than your God. And it's based on all these fervent, misguided efforts to prove that Jesus is better than everybody else. It reflects a, a really primitive mythic level of consciousness. And, uh, and you find that, again, you come back to a little helpful teaching from Ken Wilber, which he calls the line level fallacy, that, that every religious tradition, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, they all have their levels of consciousness within them. And they range from, you know, you know, really sort of tribal, mythic, divided, you know, almost magical renditions at the lower end to their most lofty non-dual. Mm. And Jesus really emerged probably, I think, as the first non-dual realized master the, the West had ever seen. Mm. Certainly the, the, the first one that the Jewish tradition he was born into mm. had seen. And so they, they, they essentially downloaded him about two layers down the level of consciousness. Mm. And, uh, and then when they finally put the Bible together and decided that Old and New Testament were both going to be in it together, a lot of the fundamentalist arm of Christianity just latched onto Old Testament passages. That, that basically go back to the Baal cults and the, you know, the mythic stages of, of early Hebrew culture to, to turn Jesus into this triumphant war god. Mm. And, uh, and so you can just look around at the time of the times and watch what the religious right was doing. If, you, if anybody got to see the video footage of the uh, attack on the Capitol on January 6th, uh, when people were waving batters of, of Jesus Christ next to batters of Donald Trump and using, you know, uh, using crosses as battering rhymes to, uh, you know, this is what Christianity does when it gets on the lower level, when it gets this, my God is bigger than your God, you know, uh, it's dangerous. This literal dualistic way of an interpreting yeah. this non-dualistic, impossible to define and encapsulate type of knowledge. Yeah. And I've heard you talk about this too, that, you know, mystics will have certain favorite verses in the Bible that they see as like particularly mystic and exciting. Is there anything that, you know, you see so many people or know so many people read on the literal level, but if you flip it on its mystical head, you'd be like, there's some deep, deep, awesome truth in that. Is there anything that stands out? One of your favorites? Well, I, I love the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Ephesians 4 that, uh, you know, the, 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 the Pauline prayer, uh, you know, I make my petition to God that you too may know in Christ the richness and the wealth and the height and the depth and so be filled with the very nature of God. Uh, there are a few other Pauline ones that are good. Uh, and of course, most of the Gospel of John, you know, I and my father are loved, you know. I love, actually, for God so loved the world that he sent his son. Mm. And I interpret that really, really differently from most of the Tell people me, in the world. Tell me, how do you? You know, well, I, I interpret it not in terms of, uh, you know, the... Uh, substitution theology of, you know, the atonement theology where God punished his, you know, sent his son because we humans were so bad. I interpret it to say that God saw that, 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 that human being and human creation, fragile and, and, and tormented though it was, mm. was so essential and precious to the nature of the full expression of divine reality that he sent his son being this really close approximation of divine consciousness uh, of his own being uh, to, to be our ombudsman.
to be in solidarity with us, to help, uh, you know, to be mm. our confessor and our, 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 you know. So I take it as a massive affirmation mm. of the goodness of the human community, mm. rather than a, uh, a remedi remediation for the badness. Can you read that also to be like, for God so loved the world that he sent you? Uh, Instead of just placing it on this person of Jesus, yeah. and to say, well, that's the object of God's deepest affection, and I should worship Jesus to understand God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would tend to say that he sent us in our particularity, mm. because the, the big trap you have to watch out is when you, you get this sort of uh, conflation of affirmation. I mean, most of most of the folks your age, I think, grew up in in a school in a school in an educational program, where everybody has to be special. Mm. You know, and the first twelve years of your life are spent with your parents convincing you how special you are, mm. and and so since that becomes a track that's laid down, really, and you know, particularly in the millennials, and I watched it in my own grandkids, you know, and uh, that that that. There's a tendency to appropriate it as me as my little person is special. And it, it, it can't be done there because it's just going to wind up inflating your own ego self, which is where you, mm. uh, again, it's like the drug thing. It's a, it's a kickstart, but it's going to be a trap mm. pretty quickly. So to at least say that he said each one of us mm. uh, is, I think, completely appropriate mm. but it gives it a collectivity that you don't get personally puffed up about it because it mm. doesn't separate you out of the pack mm. um, a couple other verses that I feel like might just be read on the literal level I'd be curious to get your mm. mystical take on them when we say I'm I am the way the truth and the light yeah. you know no one comes to the father except through me so we can go on and on about yeah. well Jesus never said that this Christianity is the exclusive truth and you have to worship yeah. him and then be like but there's this verse yeah how do you interpret that well at the at the exclusivistic level, it's horrifying, you know. And and the problem is, we hear it at the exclusive level, at the at the exoteric level, which means the literal level. We hear it as my way or the highway, and that's the way in which is standardly understood in Christianity and causes people great pain. But at at a higher level, mm. uh, you know, at what they call the mesoteric level in classic Christianity, it, it, Jesus is saying basically, I'm a path, walk me. And he's 100% correct mm. because nobody gets to the Father except doing the things that he did, that he taught, you know, unless you're willing to walk that path of self surrender, mm. voluntary incarnation, and, you know, and follow the teachings. Uh, it's you're you're not going to get the, anywhere, and it's universal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so if you take it that he's not talking about himself as an article of doctrinal faith, but saying, "Hey, look, man, you want to be conscious? This is the way I'm doing it. This is the way you have to do it." Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go find the Buddha, you can find Mohammed, you can find Lao Tse, you can find anybody, but they're going to tell you the same thing: mm -hmm. that unless you go through the eye of the needle and mm -hmm. fall through your own selfhood, you're not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I find it as a completely inclusive mm. and empirical statement. Try to get to the Father without, you know, without doing, not belief in Jesus, but walk in the walk, right. walk in the talk. And then at a still more interesting subtle level, you discover that, like I was saying right at the beginning, you can take any path in your particularity and if you walk it with the same fullness of heart, mm -hmm. it will embrace and connect to all the others. Mm -hmm. And that's what my teacher Rafe knew, that he never, you know, a lot of people are dabbling around and they've got to do at least three or four other religions so that they don't miss something and, you know, so they're, they're, they're filling it out. But, but Rafe just always walked the Christian path and, uh, and because he understood that when you really get to that, that, sublime level every spiritual teacher is in every other spiritual t teacher and radiantly so mm. so confidently accept the limitation of what's available to you mm. and take it to the limit in your own heart of hearts and you will find the, the wellspring 
I love that line of thinking. Yeah. I think you're totally on point. Yeah. Where do you assess that we're at in a broad sense of people that are that are religious and follow certain traditions from ever accepting what you just said? Because to me, that's so beautiful. And that's one of the secrets to peace on earth or some sort of more union and, you know, yeah. Well, What's preventing us from... Well, I would say that when I started plying this craft, uh, I would say that 99% of Christians would have heard that exclusively in the first way. And one of the things that's been one of the most positive fruits of the whole contemplative renewal that's been going on basically in full spring since the mid-70s or 80s is that there's a whole bunch of people now who hear it in that second way because they know what a path is now. Christianity never taught a path. They used to teach a, a system of doctrinal beliefs with, coupled with a certain kind of moral benchmarks, you know, try to be good, try to be generous, try to be, you know. But they never taught you the whole system of, of, of stilling your mind, calming your mind, reframing your consciousness, growing your consciousness. None of that was ever taught. And that's what began to get taught when Thomas Keating and Lawrence Freeman's teacher, John Bain, uh, mm. sitting there on that photo we have on the wall, uh, began to introduce Christians by the hundreds of thousands mm. to meditation. Mm. Then you began to get the possibility. So I would say that things have shifted even in my lifetime, and it's been one of the rewards of being associated with this work. I would say that now we're probably close to, oh, maybe 25% of Christians would go along with what I just really? said, you know, okay. th that they see it, and they, mm. they see it this way, and they're also willing to come back and, and forgive the, the religion of their childhood mm. because they understand now that, that it was being explained to them on a way to inclusive level, mm. but the Christianity does have more subtle levels if you prepare your mind and being to receive them. Mm. I love Richard Rohr, one of my life mottos, if, if that's yeah. the right way to call it, is to include and transcend. We don't yeah. transcend and include. Yeah. Yeah. And you've also, I've also heard you say that we have to take spiritual risks yeah. to grow. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about. Because, for example, a lot of people, you take in the United States, so afraid of what Islam is, for example. Yeah. But if you can open your heart to your... Muslim brothers and sisters and neighbors, you can yeah. have this radical transformation yeah. where you include and you, you, you sense this transcendence in your consciousness. Talk about like those spiritual risks and why it's so important to open up your heart like that. Well, uh, because a closed heart and a closed mind go hand in hand mm. and they lead swiftly and certainly to death. Mm. Uh, you know, certainly the, the death of the, the most illumined potential within your own soul. If we go back to that metaphor of the seed, uh, the seed shrivels up and dies mm. in that kind of an environment. You can only feed it with the, the continuing opening. And opening is often brings humiliation. Humiliation coming from the word humble, which means you have to adopt beginner's mind and you have to realize you may be wrong. You have to let go of positions uh, once firmly held and this sort of elation of certainty, you know. And when people just won't let go of their own certainty, which is what's tearing the world apart nowadays, uh, because they're too terrified of the alternative, you have dead people. You have dead worlds. You have dead civilization. Nothing alive is flowing in it. And it's a, it's a terrible, mm. terrible uh, uh, pandemic nowadays. The verse, blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God, I yeah. think is so powerful and so interesting. And this idea of pure heart that yeah. I think sometimes is where we, where we come from, but we, we get to in those states of, yeah. of centering prayer. Yeah. What, is, what, do you, what does it mean to you to be pure of heart? And why does that allow, allow us to see God? Yeah. Well, in the ancient traditions, which of course I never heard anything about growing up as a kid in Sunday yeah. school, uh, the heart was not this seat of emotions that we call it today, of sentimentality and pathos and drama. The heart was an organ of spiritual seeing. 
it's, it's actually what you used to see God, as Jesus was saying. He was just, uh, you know, he was either inaugurating the teaching in the West, but he was quoting a proverbial truth that the, it's not the intellectual center that sees. It's this other faculty of perception. Uh, and so uh, pure in heart really, for me, comes closer to, uh, to talking about the, a hardwiring of consciousness that doesn't split the playing field into subject, object, inside, outside, me and them. In other words, in what the, what the parlance of today would call something more closely approaching mm. non-dual perception. Mm. But I want to emphasize that it's not just a state of consciousness. Uh, the, the other component of the heart thing in it is it it brings with it a deep sense of conscience. Okay. In French, these two words are the same, la conscience. That's not one for consciousness and another for conscience. In other words, it's a, it's a seeing that's deeply suffused hmm. with compassion, conscience, and a sense of doing uh, what is required in love, hmm. even at the cost of one's own death. So, so that's what pure of heart is. It has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, you know, sex or sexual abstinence or anything like that. Uh, mm. Nothing to do with sex. Right. It's interesting. This concept of humility, I think, is, is so important. And I wonder if the word is sort of, you have to understand why being humble and humiliated in a non-dual way is where we get to it. Why is humbling yourself and humility so important? And how do you kind of assess that sort of in a non-dual way of thinking? Yeah, well, if you approach it, not from the point of view of the mind, but from the point of view of body gesture, uh, when, when you humble yourself, you let go. Yeah. So, and the opposite, when you don't humble yourself, you either do you hang on for dear life or you defend. Both of those are closed positions. And we've discovered now neurologically, a lot of people working in brain science and, you know, uh, and uh, have discovered that the act of opening and letting go does shift consciousness from a small and kind of really kind of cognitive conceptual knowing that's very associated with goals and drives and a small sense of me into the spacious mind. You can they actually have neurological FMRI research that, that says so that the let go, which is surrender or self humbling, mm. is the gateway into spacious mind. Mm. So without any kind of moral lessons beyond that on it, that's why it works. Mm. And that's the tie rod with centering prayer where we start practicing that just you're letting go of thoughts, letting go of thoughts, letting go, so that you learn to approach life rather than doing like this, doing like this. And, and that's why it's so important because it's the, when you block like this, Nothing's going to get in. Nothing's going to change. Nothing. You got all the all your self importance you want, but you don't have anything else. Mm. On top of humility, there's this idea of discernment that I've. It's a word that just floats around in my head a lot because I think someone like myself, who, in the in the process of being humble and open hearted, you're always wary of: Am I letting the wrong idea in? Am mm. I letting too many ideas yeah. in? Is there something? that I should reject, but using discernment to assess that. Talk about what is discernment to you and why is it so important yeah. in spiritual growth? Yeah, well, discernment has to do with purity of heart and all this. It's like uh, that there is something in us that's very, very closely synced with the divine and the unboundaried. It's there, the seed that we're talking about. But we can, uh, we can distort the signals pretty quickly. Mm. It's one of the functions you know, of our small self to take something that we've heard correctly for a nanosecond and then turn it into some big story that, you know. Uh, so uh, the, the good news is that you're not alone. Mm. That 
This is the most important issue for the desert fathers and mothers. I mean, I would say that, a, you know, three quarters of their teaching is about discernment of spirits. Exactly the same question you asked. How do you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's often couched in those days at the level of how do you know whether this is from the Holy Spirit or from the devil? Mm. Uh, but uh, how do you know, we would say in psychological language, whether it's coming from a genuine inspiration of spaciousness or whether it's coming from a, uh, you know, a false self-agenda mm. that's just playing very insistently? And the answer is you don't at the start mm. because the squeaky wheel will get the oil. And for a long time, we're so good at deluding ourselves, and you know that we're so addicted to our own drama and our own story that we don't discern clearly. Uh, we don't know our instrument well. Uh, and so about 90% of the work on the spiritual path is really learning to play your own instrument. Mm. You discover your own angle of deflection. Mm. Where you get blindsided easily, why? Uh, the desert fathers and mothers were on to that early on. Mm. Uh, the good news is that the, uh, the correct answer is not in the right decision, but in the honest struggle. Mm. And, you know, either way you make a decision and go one way, uh, something is going to be eliminated. And there's going to be grief, and it's going to find its way back into what you do in the next mm. step. Uh, that's part of the process. Mm. And if we if we did put so much emphasis on getting it right, mm. uh, and realizing that, in all honesty and humility, that we're imperfect instruments trying to hear the tune. Uh, knowing that mistakes are going to be made, knowing that mistakes are forgiven mm. and are folded in and transcended and included mm. as we're able to see them and not, you know, not be defensive about them. As you learn that, you get more comfortable. Uh, in all the traditions that take seriously uh, transformation, guidance, spiritual guidance is a non-negotiable. Uh, it comes from different sources. In some traditions, it's a guru. In the Christian mm. tradition, it's been a trusted confessor. Mm. Nowadays, we have spiritual guidance groups. But there's a deep realization that we are fragile and fallible, that uh, the Holy Spirit will always speak to us in our hearts. Mm. But you can't make that as an, over, as an either or, because the Holy Spirit is always speaking to us in our hearts, but we're not capable of listening. So. Uh, you're back to the both and again. You talked about the, the discernment and the spaciousness. Yeah. Um, is, that, is that kind of ideas, if you're sitting and meditating on an idea and it doesn't welcome that spacious feeling, you could discern possibly yeah. that that is something that you can eliminate. And in that spaciousness and in that moment, you feel that joy that you're tuned into. You can use that. And you go into those places a lot. Yeah, to yeah. test what you're thinking and yeah. Yeah, but there's another component to that, and that's that's uh, your head lies incessantly, mm. your emotions lie reliably, your body never lies, and the way you're first going to learn to play your instrument is through sensation. Mm. You will learn when constriction is present. Uh, and what does that feel like? What would be a practical way to be like, oh? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a gross level that's easy to pick it up. I mean, when your face is getting tense, or you, you begin to learn where, you're, where you carry tension normally when you're in a defended mode. And so when you're sitting in meditation, you go to those places and relax them deliberately. Or when you're getting a quote, quote, inspiration, the first thing you do is check out, you know, is there constriction there? Mm. Uh, then there's more subtle constriction as you get more aware of your instrument and where it's landing. Is this landing in my head? Is this landing in my solar plexus? Is this landing? How is it flowing? Is there, you just watch mm. how the inner body within the outer body is handling. And if you're getting more urgent, if you're getting more self-important, if you're getting more excited or inflated, uh, 
then you're uh, then you're you have reason to suspect that you've just distorted your own discernment. So uh, I think the most valuable survival method that you can begin to work on yourself for uh, better accuracy and discernment mm. is really becoming attuned to how sensation lives in your body in both mm. a muscular and a vascular level. I love that. Um, let's talk about suffering, if you don't mind. Sure. And remind me, I really wanted to get your take on sort of Satan and Lucifer in the Bible, because, for example, my old thinking was, well, there's this force outside of God called Satan, and yeah. that's the source of evil, and it's at odds in some cosmic battle mm. with this man called God. Yeah. And then in some of your teaching and, and listening to Rohr and Finley, there's this idea that it's all kind of in a non-dual way. It's all together, and it, you know, goodness flows from the suffering, and suffering, all, they're connected. What are, what are the origins of suffering as far as you're concerned, and do you reject this idea of a separate entity outside of God? Well, I think the most important thing, we've all been dealing with these sort of truncated either or, is a suffering real or is it, you know, we don't have the whole picture. Mm. And I think the person who came closest to giving us the whole picture was the, the you know, the Russian hermeticist and, and teacher G.I. Gurdjieff. Uh, who articulated uh, the law of three and and basically said really strongly, uh, and it's been around anyway, Jacob Burma, the Christian mystic, was doing the same thing, but not using the same vocabulary, that if you if you want the great divine entity, endless, formless, eternal, mm -hmm. eternal inflation, the, the unboundary, inaccessible light, as the Christians call it, to interform and create visible worlds. This just doesn't happen like this. Something has to shift within the nature of the divine. Uh, Burma, the 17th century Christian mystic, says uh, the, the, the inner unity, the endless unity, has to bring himself into separability and divisibility in order for creation to happen. It's not just God sits up there in heaven and says, let there be light. I mean, that something has to happen within the composition, the inner structure of infinitude for it to move to a form. Uh, Gurdjieff discovered this and articulated this as the law of three, which has been corroborated across the board in science, sociology, all sorts of things, but never by this. It says basically that for any new arising to happen, any creation out of non-creation, it has to be the intertwining of three forces. One, which he called affirming, which is the pushing force, mm. you know, that has the action. One called denying, which is either the push back or simply the passive medium through which something flows. And then a third called the reconciling, which allows these two to stop just push-pulling, but to enter into a new kind of relationship out of which something new emerges. So, uh, so basically the idea was that uh, out of the the push-pull in God between, in the one hand, this thing that wants to create, mm. you know, this imperative to do something in form, the, and in the other hand, the, the resistance of the inaccessible to, uh, you know. What emerges out of that is the third, which is suffering. Mm. And uh, it ain't going to go away. That's where the Christian mm. path disagrees with the Buddhists, because it's the condition, it's the third term which allows the new arising to happen. Uh, and to suffering, the, the word actually means I allow. We always put on it the dimension of physical and emotional pain nowadays, but that's not what the roots say. It's just an allowing, which means there's an I there that's conscious of letting something happen. Uh, so bottom line, long bottom line, is that, yeah, suffering is a part of the mix, and uh, and that through it, in combination with these other, uh, 
that there's going to, that something new will arise and then through the law of three that will give birth to something. So it just keeps rolling on and on. So the bottom line is that there isn't a separate ontological force called evil or the devil which goes head to head in the boxing ring with the force of good which is God. Uh, that's the fail, that's the this too small map that everybody's working out of and reacting out of. It's like if you want to have this dance between the infinite and the finite in which new creation and dynamism is the result, these are the terms. And the, the, uh, the idea is not to eliminate a term, but to, to transform it. Mm. And so what, it's interesting because I say this all the time to people, it was only through my own suffering that I came to this place yeah. of the next level of consciousness. Yeah. But my level, and my level is, my life is such a life of privilege. Yeah. And I, sometimes I call it, and maybe this is not wise, but sort of privilege pain, privilege yeah. stress, yeah. right? And so you and I talk about the suffering. I'm like, oh, suffering's been amazing for me. And I'm so yeah. grateful for that suffering and yeah. that, that loneliness that made me appreciate friends and stuff. But what do we say to those whose suffering is, is not privileged suffering? It yeah. is extreme suffering, and that's all they ever knew in this wondrous thing called reality and earth. How do you process that? Well, I process that first of all in the mystical body of Christ. Uh, mm. And that that's the obligation that comes with us when we, uh, when we enter serving prayer, which is another reason why I'm so adamantly opposed to trying to make of these things big private mystical experiences of oneness. Mm because there's a, a plank's constant of human misery and suffering. And what do you do with like little kids being born in war-torn Gaza? I mean, what do you, mm. you know? And that our own hearts of those of us who have, have been born in privilege, uh, we are absolutely required mm. to carry the being. Mm. Uh, and as they carry something for us as well. So, uh, you know, it's at the state of the greater collectivity of the human family uh, in, the, in the eyes of God, and the sense of the, the terrible suffering that has to be paid for anything, uh, for, uh, for arising. I mean, suffering is the shadow side of the, of the, of the fullness of love. And, uh, and it's not going to go away. So we have to bear it collectively and mm. with deep conscience is, my, is my, my response to it. And I think this is what is intended if you can push through all the drama and all the literalism of around putting Jesus on the cross as the central symbol of Christianity. It really says that God's saying, I own this suffering that I understand that this is the cost, that this was, this was the deal that had to be, you know, consummated for anything to exist. And the, the whole idea of God sent his only son, it doesn't mean he sent one little person in flesh and blood to do it, and that, so nobody has to do it. It's saying, from the depths of the divine heart, the divine yearning, uh, out of the divine nature, uh, the divine sends its own promise of solidarity in this because it's the way it is. Does it hurt you to be on this wavelength and level of consciousness and see that kind of pain? Because we talk about Gaza, let's talk about yeah. this, because what I find fascinating about you is your head's not buried in the sand. You're paying attention to, to the news, you're paying attention to politics, you're aware of yeah. what's happening in our world. When How do you assess a genocide in Gaza and how do you mourn that or process that? You know, I hold it in the, in the heart of Christ. I mean, I, I've learned what I'm personally responsible for and the pain that I'm personally responsible for, for the suffering I've personally inflicted. Mm -hmm. I have an absolute uh, requirement to see and to atone for insofar as it's possible. Uh, but there's a lot of other sorrow and suffering that I didn't create and that I can't personally do anything but witness. And so I, 
I have to, as much as possible, witness from this deeper heart of 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 God. You know, I I'm enough of a <clears throat> of a Gebserian evolutionist that I really sort of think that what we're seeing at this point, and what's so terribly poignant for our own thing, is the is a is a perfect storm of events that can that could wipe out the human species and could conceivably take the planet right back down to the geosphere. I mean, when you've got the the end of an era of civilization, which has risen and fallen by the power of the the intellectual center and the you know the the rational mind and cleverness and the ego self. Uh, it's just biting the dust, and the religions that were all founded at the headwaters of these this age are, you know, are dropping like flies. It's not just Christianity. I mean, a lot of the religious traditions are, in, and our cultural uh, institutions are in disarray, and our, uh, you know, and and global warming, climate change is spinning out of control, mm. and. You know, human beings may just have reached the end point of a whole huge level of evolution, you know, of divine manifestation. Mm. And I, if I can't wake up to that point and absorb it with, with sober lucidity, mm. you know, there's not an awful lot of point in being here. Mm. I mean, you have to stand and you have to realize that you're standing in a position of privilege. And as you stand in that position, what can I do out in this beautiful privileged place mm -hmm. except to pray for everyone else? Mm -hmm. uh, from this point of privilege, but also from privileged solidarity. Because mm -hmm. we, you know, if we go all go up and in flames, uh, it's all of us, the privileged and the non-privileged together. And the last thing we're going to do is to either look each other in the face with love or, you know, look like caged beasts. What is your belief or, or hope of a child blown up in a bomb in Gaza right now, that that was their short time on this earth? What do you think happens well, to them? In a sense, not in a sense. I believe that every soul that's created is already full at the moment of, of creation. And this goes across the board. Uh, from the moment something quickens by, you know, the, the, the daddy and the mama and the Holy Spirit or whatever, and something takes place as an individual soul-bearing unit, uh, it's perfect, and what you have of life as a duration and time is not so much so that you acquire something you were lacking, but so that you express something that was needed in that dance of finitude and infinitude. So, I, you know, in a deep sense, I don't worry too much mm. about those whose lives are cut tragically short. Uh, that who haven't gotten to manifest everything in life they can be because I don't think life gives us anything we didn't have already. It just gives us a possibility to express it in the name and fullness of God. And if we don't do that in this dimension and plane of existence, uh, it's still all in God. And, and I don't exist apart from the whole. Maybe some combination called Cynthia will chug around again in a few more millennia. Maybe not. I mean, it's, uh, uh, but, but it's all held in the whole. So I think the closer we can get to actually living out of the whole and realizing that these perturbations that we see as just unthinkable are not only real, but happening, but they're happening within the whole. I mean, I think it's that level of impartiality that has to exist to, to be present to the planet in love as it goes through this crisis that it didn't create, we created it. Mm -hmm. And I think any attempts to think our religion is going to bail, bail us out, our concepts of God, our notions, mm -hmm. our, I mean, this is all just self-calming. 
uh, that it will unfold inexorably as it has to, to in, you know, in karmic response to the idiocies we've created. But I think that still through that, that divine scientia, as Burma called it, that seed in God that said, yes, this is good, that love is fullness, is still out there doing its thing. Mm. And that not in spite of, but even because and through the very direness of the conditions, it's possible to touch this in ever more illumined ways mm. if you have the, the stomach to take it. Is part of the wisdom you might impart on someone like myself is just to accept the suffering and just to feel it and see where that kind of takes you and just to not get trapped in some sort of a sense of a utopia is coming here. Like this is the way it is. Yeah. To just dig deep and be broken yeah. by that reality and yeah. see where it, see what fruits it bears for you. Yeah. No, no stories attached, no emotional drama attached, just the ability to stand present. Huh? One of my deep, one of my really good and esteemed Buddy's uh, Adam Bucko, young, younger contemplative, has written a beautiful book called Let Your Heartbreak Be Your Guide. And I think that's a wonderful title and a wonderful way of reframing what we're called to. Mm. That, and uh, you can stand more pain than you think you can if you don't put it in story and don't make it all about you. It's a, the simplest form is just breathing in, breathing out. And, uh, and to do even something really simple like to say for the next five minutes and set your time, I set your timer, I simply breathe in, breathe out mm -hmm. in solidarity with the world in a deep willingness to help. And then don't do anything more. Your body will take it. It's, uh, and don't lace it up and don't let pictures flash before your minds of screaming children and things like that because it'll just capture it in anger and drama. Mm. But as we impartially, the, it's, a, it's a simple variation on, a, on a, a practice which is taught with much, great, much more rigor in the Buddhist tradition called Tonglen, mm. which is how one consciously takes in and transforms the enormous suffering of another. And it's not something that you could learn irresponsibly. It's a, it's, a, it's a serious spiritual practice of the Buddhist tradition taught to advanced practitioners. Mm -hmm. to, so the sense that most of us in the West with our over-manicured hothouse plant psyches and vulnerabilities and fragilities uh, can go around, oh, now I'm going to breathe in the pain of the children in Gaza. You're just going to fry your sockets because there has to be a deepening of impartiality within you. But the, the great monastic traditions have done this. The, and a lot of those desert sannyasins who go out into the world and into the forests and sit on mountains, my, my teacher Rafe at the monastery, would sit in the cabin and simply breathe in, you know, the pain. You know, the, the Christian phrase, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on me. It's still the, pray it's still the prayer of our age. Hmm. A couple more questions. Are we good to go for 10 minutes? I'm just yeah. looking at your watch. You okay yeah. with that? Yeah. Um, again, talking about the news, just to get your take, and I've heard you speak a little bit about this, and I hate to even bring up this man's name, but Donald Trump is mm. almost more relevant today than he was. I thought this is somebody that perhaps we could stop thinking about to a degree, but he set in motion a movement, a sort of feeling into sort of certain sectors of Christianity. There's to be talk about Christian nationalism now. Mm -hmm. We see a man that in my discernment is so clearly evil, I might use that word, and what he's spreading in the word into the world. Mm -hmm. um, what are you sensing in America about the impact he's had in this spiritual sense? And are you afraid or worried about a second Trump term? Uh, you know, I, I would say that Trump is a wrecking ball, uh, and he certainly is causing the result of bringing the highest institutions and highest aspirations of humankind down 
I mean, he's, he's wrecked the whole political idealism that founded the, the nations in the, uh, you know, certainly American nation. Uh, but the, the Enlightenment theories, he's wrecked truth. He's wrecked Christianity. I mean, to watch these, these people behaving like, you know, banshee tribes, you know, willing to completely repudiate truth let alone morality. And so he's, I think that, that he has placed America in essentially a, a traumatic, uh, you know, a collective trauma bonding, mm. which is what happens when you have profound, inescapable exposure to evil people, you know, that psychotic people. So, uh, and from there, the hysteria, you know, has, is is met and redoubled with similar kinds of uh, weird distortions in governments all over the world. And so it's a collective swinging back. Uh, I'm, I'm not so much worried about what's happening in uh, the, the second term, because it's, it's clear what's happening in the second term. It, it's, it's a complete reversion to this dangerous, militant uh, fascism. Mm. I mean, Trump has made it irrevocably clear, the people that uh, are voting for him, uh, that we'll see the, the radical curtailment of American freedoms and the people's doors being knocked at, that mm. where people, I mean, it's, it's absolutely the shattering of the dream of safety, independence, and personal freedom. Mm. That's what is headed. And they're gonna elect him by a landslide, I think, barring some uh, miracle. Uh, and you know, I can still pray for the pray, but I, I'm often careful as I watch things to say, well, maybe the wrecking ball is needed now because uh, these these institutions are bankrupt, and it's been the intellectual culture that has uh, brought us as its final stunning achievements, AI, mm. and other things that could put the the human conscience out of business. Uh, so, you know, maybe it's good for it to go. Uh, and so all I can do is to try and maintain impartiality, uh, pray again, as we've talked about, for the solidity of the human family, and as we go through it, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful scene in that little movie, Don't Look Up, Mm. You know, and it's, I actually copied the prayers, you know, where they're, they finally, they finally get their heads out of their tuchuses and realize that they are absolutely going to be destroyed. And then in that last scene, they had this kind of last supper and everybody, somebody says, we should pray, but nobody knows how to pray anymore. And one mm. kid who was raised evangelical says, well, praying goes something like this. And he, he, he offers this beautiful final prayer about forgive us of our arrogance and our stupidity mm -hmm. and our humility and and allow us to face what's coming with courage and compassion mm -hmm. and I, I I put that prayer a prayer on my refriger refrigerator I, I think it's the prayer of our time mm -hmm. uh, it, it really you never know where these are coming from mm -hmm. but I really think it's the collective prayer mm -hmm. that if from our own collective arrogance where to go down, uh, may we go down, may we go up when we go down. May we actually see the beauty of the Lord, you know. And I, I hold out some possibility, I know in the Old Testament there's the, the wonderful story of King Josiah who's out messing around, he finally finds the book of the law that's been buried for 200 years. They say he rins his garments and, in despair at how far they've wandered off the mark. And the Lord forgives them and gives them another chance. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether we're going to have a Josiah moment. We'll discover that uh, in the election. I wouldn't bet on it. But if by some miracle the divine providence and karma decides that enough of the human race is serious about looking soberly into its flaws and amending them, that somehow we're given another chance. Mm. Uh, may we have the gumption and the courage and the humility to use it well, to really uh, 
respectfully bury what's dying and respectfully midwife what's to come. Hmm. In closing, just as I, w- I would be remiss, and I've totally left it to the end and I had it in my mind up here, but Thomas Keating, who's just someone that I wanted to learn a little bit about because I don't know that much about the man. And I was, instead of just reading everything I could, I was like, I want to sit with Cynthia yeah. and get some firsthand knowledge. Tell me about, he was a huge mentor of yours and he contributed a lot to this concept of set, contemplative prayer. Who was he and why was he, why, what, was, what drew you to him so much? Well, Thomas Keating, by the time I became aware of him and the in the, 19, in the mid-1980s, was already emerging as, a, as the Christian major teacher and chief architect of a method of meditation called Sidering Prayer. Mm. Uh, he was a Trappist abbot, monk. He was a Trappist monk for 75 years, you know, the, being the same order that we're in here at Bonneveau, but a more rigorous uh, sect mm. of it. And... Uh, and together with John Main, who founded Christian Meditation, two, two Christian monastics who realized that Christians needed to get meditating again or they were going to lose the whole shebang. Mm-hmm. So he'd become quite well established in teaching Centering Prayer. I came out to the monastery, the St. Benedict's Monastery in Snowmass, Colorado, to, to take a 10-day intensive formation retreat and uh, at his invitation. And then we worked together, and he, he, he formed me as a teacher, and we were, we were he, he, was, he was my teacher in Centering Prayer and my mentor and, uh, and a good friend. Mm-hmm. So, but he, he emerged largely through the practice of Centering Prayer. In the last 30 years of his life, it really through this practice of just letting go and letting go, as we've been talking about, that's the essence of it. Let go of your thinking, let go of your attitudes. Let go. Uh, he became uh, deeply transformed himself. You could watch the process happening. So I, I've actually just completed writing a book about him, which will be uh, published in November of 2024, called Thomas Keating, The the Making of a Modern Christian Mystic, Mm. to look at this. But he was one of the spiritual giants of this century Mm. uh, who extended the roadmap of Christian uh, contemplative experience, who really deeply explored the non-dual terrain from a Christian Mm. uh, standpoint, was a pioneer in inner spirituality, uh, a good friend of the Dalai Lamas and many others of the great religious leaders of the world, uh, convinced of the unity of the human family and of oneness, uh, a great honor to be uh, in his presence. Mm. Just lastly, because I'm such a fan of you and I'm a fan, I've interviewed Finley and I'm a huge fan of Richard Rohr, as I've mentioned, you guys get lumped together as like, it's like the three-headed, you know, in a good way, the monster trying to bring this contemplative view and non-dual thinking and, and you've influenced so many people around the world. How would you sort of, you know, taking as three different sort of superheroes in that realm, what are your different strengths, especially to talk about James, for example, and Richard, what do you think that they are contributing that is, is special and how, what do you see as their unique gift? Well, Richard has definitely got the prophet's mantle on him up. Uh, what was really and is really brilliant to about Richard is that he worked within a strictly Catholic milieu, he was Franciscan, youngest of like nine kids or something like this, and, and uh, very quickly early in life drawn to radical social action and compassion. Mm-hmm. And uh, so basically he has a simple, clear, folksy, and yet spiritually sophisticated way of completely repositioning Christianity away from its worst sort of uh, imperialistic habits and in the direction of the radical simplicity of the heart of Jesus. He's liberated, he's, he's, he's reached out to a lot of marginalized groups, uh, you know, including both men's and women's groups, uh, to create a really inclusive uh, Alternative orthodoxy, as he rightly calls it. Mm. So he's one of the. He's been one of the most powerful uh, 
revisers and revitalizers of Christianity. You know, he's just really pulled it up by its bootstraps. Jim, I think, is a uh, is a beautiful, enlightened being with a deep Irish mystical heart, a love for the mystics. He's uh, and yet strong, strong practices both a, a psychotherapist and, and with some some Buddhist path to. Uh, so he's got a good kind of phenomenological approach to the whole mysticism, and it, again, a deep, compassionate radiance that, that people almost can't be in Jim's presence without receiving uh, baraka, uh, you know, the is... Sufi term for blessing, an actual mm. transmission of a kind of grace of love. Mm. He's a He's an enlightened being in the Christian tradition, enlightened not in the mind, uh, not just in the mind, but but like a light bulb yeah. that that can just change a room by by when somebody flicks them on. Yeah. You know, I'm a I think I'm a troubler of of Israel. <laughs> you know, I, I I like the esoteric traditions. I work with mindfulness. I work with Gurdjieff with wisdom. Yeah. I, I'm very much. Uh, you know, I'm I'm intellectual for certain people's cups of tea. Uh, I don't mind, uh, and but I I want to, you know, I I like to to create maps and to find the maps that are big enough to accommodate the pieces. I'm I'm very much a believer, as the Buddhists say, that we get into a lot of trouble when we don't have right views of things. And a lot of the reasons we don't is because our traditions have been working with partial truths, mm. and the answer is not going to some esoteric sources and finding new documents. Mm. It's opening the range of what we're conscious of so that we can, we can actually grow and evolve. Mm. So I, I think I've been trying, basically trying to contribute to the, the, both the theory and practice of what I call the wisdom Christianity, mm. which puts the actual nuts and bolts of transformation at the, at the heart of the whole thing. That was beautiful. And just a wrap, final, final question. As, as I go off from here, from meeting you from this place and return to my life and other people who may be listening who go through a lot of moments of doubt, they, they feel this kind of energy that you're talking about. They've had these beautiful moments, but life becomes sort of heavy and it's hard and they want to, it's hard to really believe in this big bang of love and, and to stay confident in the value of life and to being optimistic about the future, so to speak. What is your words of encouragement, maybe ways that you encourage yourself in moments of doubt and knowing that it's so hard to stay on this path and to stay hopeful? Well, I'd say, first of all, don't be afraid of discouragement. Okay. It's all part of it. And those moments of utter despair are going to come, and it's okay. That your real faith is that you can survive them and live through them, and that we often use spiritual practice to, to cut you know, to cut out, to, to too quickly revert back to positivity. Mm. Sometimes we live for long, long, long times in the darkness, and you, you get used to a kind of being able to see in the dark that may be very valuable. So I'd say keep yourself as, as together as you can in really simple things, uh, without fastidiousness, but just eat, sleep, have sex, <laughs> be regular, uh, be in life with all you can in the simple ways, try to be present, uh, get a simple meditation practice so that you can sort of turn your mind off when it sort of is running out of control, and uh, move forward because if God is real at all, if the divine is real at all, now you take this as a wager, then it has to have some power and intelligence, right? Mm. And uh, if we can simply believe that this intelligence and compassion does exist, it allows us then to see the little bits and pieces of it, of it that we experience it in our own lives, which we do, mm. as puzzle pieces of the whole. And piece by piece, we connect a puzzle of our own being. Amen. 
Thank you so much for your time, Cindy. It's such an honor to meet you, and thanks for bringing me to this wonderful place and for this, this wonderful time. Well, thank you. A lovely interview, and, and do carry your work on. I mean, it's, it's in the, the generation that you belong to uh, that this whole thing is going to move to a new stage. I'm trying. Yeah, I know. And I, I, James said this thing to me at the end of our interview where I was like, I feel called and I want to do something. I want to do something. He's like, you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. This is the call. And yeah. so I take, I took that to heart and I've, I've rested that with no, me as I'd, I seek, as I seek. I, uh, I'd say the same thing that, that you're, you're getting the message out. You're, in, you're opening the conversation at a very high level, uh, to people in your generation and those to come after you that, that, that will need to find their way to this stuff and do right. So yeah. it's a it's divine work, and I think we 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 give you audiences because we recognize that in you. Thank you. Thank you.